There's one inescapable fact about our lives, and that is that one day we will all die. I tend to think that uh, we hope that this passing will be painless, in familiar surroundings, and uh, preferably in our sleep. But for thousands of people across the globe, uh, especially those who have been murdered, that is not the case. And I've dedicated the last quarter century of my life trying to help those individuals, to give them a voice so they can be heard. Let us begin this journey with a very interesting slide. Oops. Here. Uh, hopefully, uh, this invokes a number of questions in your mind. But for law enforcement, uh, there are two paramount questions of importance. The first is, is it human? Uh, being a forensic anthropologist, I can tell you that, yes, indeed, you're looking at the back of a skull of an adult Caucasian male. Uh, you will notice that, uh, where'd my picture go? <laughs> you will notice that uh, there's a protuberance there called the external occipital protuberance. And if you reach right behind your head, you can feel that little bump. And there's, believe me, there's no shame in fondling your protuberance in public. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a great icebreaker at parties, too, but that's another lecture. Um, and the second most important question that law enforcement asks is, was a crime committed? And we have three choices. I think we can safely rule out suicide. And then we have homicide and accidental. Uh, the next questions law enforcement typically asks are the five W's. Who, what, when, where, and why. Of those when, or when did the person die, determining the post-mortem interval is probably most frequently asked, but is also the most difficult. I first became interested in the post-mortem interval when I heard the story of Colonel Shy, Confederate Army, shot point-blank in the forehead with a mini-ball at the Battle of Nashville in 1864, buried in the coffin you see here in civilian clothing. 110 years later, grave robbers looking for Civil War artifacts desecrated his grave, pulled him out of the hole that they did, they damaged the coffin, uh, pulled him out of that hole and plopped him on top of the coffin. Uh, he, these grave robbers were then run off by the caretaker of the cemetery, who called law enforcement, police came. They found a body so well preserved that they thought the individual had been dead only about a year, and so they initially began a homicide investigation. So the post-mortem interval termination was off by 110 years. <laughs> Obviously, some research needed to be done in this area. But where do you do this type of research? In one place is the Anthropological Research Facility at the University of Tennessee. This facility was started by Dr. William Bass in 1972, and people can donate their remains or have family members donate their remains if they don't like you um, to this <laughs> particular facility for research purposes. This facility is two acres in size, and uh, you essentially decompose in an outdoor natural setting. While many research projects go on out here, uh, the study of decomposition um, is probably the primary ones that go on here. Uh, here we see an individual in a cage, uh, decomposing to keep the little critters off of them, you know, the squirrels, chipmunks, raccoons. Uh, here we see someone just wrapped in clothing. And here we see an interesting study with concrete pads. Um, for some reason, um, there was a rash of family members who happened to vanish, which just so happened to coincide with the pouring of a new driveway or a new house foundation. So you can imagine where those individuals ended up. So we did a study looking at how to penetrate the concrete layer looking for clandestine graves. Now, 30 years ago, the post-mortem interval on something like this was done in one of three ways. One is by the use of forensic entomology, which is studying the life cycles of the iridescent blowflies that colonize the body. One way was done morphologically, or how the body looks. Now, the soft tissue of the body, made of proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids, break down into four stages, fresh, bloat, decay, and dry. Be glad I didn't show you those photos. <laughs> um, and that rate of decay is based on environmental parameters like temperature, moisture, pH, and the amount of oxygen present. The third way is doing the, uh, a process called looking at the mortis triad. Mortis means of death. 
And this triad is composed of rigor mortis, which is the stiffening and relaxation of the musculature, alga mortis, which is a cooling of the body to ambient temperature, and then liva mortis, which is a settling and decomposition of blood products. Unfortunately, in this particular case, the environment's too cold for flies to be flying around. Uh, and the latter two methods that I just mentioned are very inaccurate. So we spent a number of years looking for biomarkers um, that are useful in determining the postmortem interval. And we found these in something called volatile fatty acids. This was profound in a number of ways. The first is that it showed that an interdisciplinary approach could be used to look at anthropological questions. It also showed this was the first study of whole body decomposition and showed that it could be chemically characterized. And the third is that uh, volatile fatty acids ended up being ideal markers for an indication of the end of soft tissue decomposition. This then led to the formation of statistical analysis for this type of work. It led to the, ba uh, for, um, the initiation of formula-based methods of doing time since death. And it led to the discovery of other biomarkers so accurate that if you died a month ago, we could tell you within 12 hours of when you died. Unfortunately, I mean, volatile fatty acids come from soft tissue breakdown of fat and muscle. But unfortunately, not all death scenes involve soft tissue, uh, which makes things more complicated, of course. And here we have skeletalized remains. Now, when you're holding a piece of bone in your hand, you are not holding a piece of calcium. Bone is composed of two components, collagen, which is a protein, and a mineral called hydroxyapatite. And these go also go through a process of decomposition called diagenesis. And as the bone decomposes, uh, a number of products, uh, these inorganic components, um, are released, and we can use those as well for doing times and death determinations. Unfortunately, you can't do the post-mortem interval determination until you actually find the body. And who, what we see here is Sergeant Paul Dosti and his trusted companion, Buster. This was taken out of the Death Valley by the Barco Ranch, where Charles Manson used to hide out. And yes, the body's still out there, but we can talk about that later. Um, but the buster, the canine, is a human remains detection canine. And they are absolutely amazing animals. Uh, people claim they have single molecule detection capabilities. Others claim that their capabilities and sensitivities are in the low parts per trillion. Some of the critics claim that they're costly, difficult, and time-consuming to train. <laughs> well, you can say that about people as well. For me, the problem with the dogs is that they can't talk. That's the only problem I have with them. And, but we're working on ways around that. <laughs> because the dogs can't talk to you, they can't tell you what chemicals they are smelling. So we did an eight-year study looking at, as we decompose, what chemicals are liberating soft tissue and endoskeletal material decomposition. We did this at the decay facility. Uh, to do this, we buried bodies. And I'm not, out, I'm not in jail, so it, not many people can say that you can bury <laughs> bodies and, and still be you know, out of jail. But we buried a number of bodies, and we put a piping system below and above these individuals and monitored the gases and volatiles that are coming off these individuals. Uh, that we created a database of 500 chemicals. Uh, we took those 500 chemicals and ranked them based on a number of parameters like prevalence, longevity, um, the abundance in the environment, reproducibility, body to body. And we pared it down to 30 chemicals, which we considered most important in human decomposition. I think the results will surprise you. Known carcinogens, components of gasoline, stinky compounds like, you know, what you find in bogs and swamps. Mothballs. <laughs> Plastic precursors. More carcinogens. Alkanes like hexane. And interesting compounds like fluorinated compounds. These compounds are very similar to what you find in your air conditioning unit or the coolant system of your refrigerator. Isn't that interesting? But how do we take the knowledge that we gained here and apply it to forensic situations. Let's go out to California. Here we have a 40-acre plot of land. Someone at, somewhere out there, a young woman was killed and buried 12 years ago. 
So where do you begin? Well, you begin by bringing in the human remains detection canine. This is an aerial view of that same area. Uh, that previous picture was taken about here looking south. Each one of these yellow dots is where a dog alerted. Okay, now, are, are there 40, 50 bodies out there? Well, no. Um, is the dog wrong? No. So what's going on here? One of the things we found out is that as the body decomposes in a burial situation, which is called the point source, these chemicals that we found in the database migrate in the subsurface in a plume. And we've tracked this plume up to a kilometer away from where the body is. Okay, so that's quite complicated. So now what's our next step? Our next step is to develop our own Labrador, an electronic version. We may not be good at a lot of things, but we can nail those acronyms, okay? <laughs> This instrument was designed specifically for two purposes. One, to track the chemical plume, and the second, to give the operator an idea of which area has the highest concentration. Because where the body is is where the concentration will be the highest, and as the plume migrates, it moves away. But of course, the dog can't tell you that. Now, in this instrument, down here, uh, where all the sensors are, right close to the ground, right where the dog would be sniffing. There are 12 sensors in there, um, and each one is, is modulated at different frequency. Now, that modulated uh, frequency is, is then turned into a pure sine wave and split between an audio output here and a visual display there. The visual display looks like something like this. So now you can go to all the different points where the canine has alerted and determine what the concentration of, of the chemicals we're looking for are. Each one of these bars indicates a different class of chemicals that the sensor is responding to. Uh, to date, these chemical signatures have led to the discovery of over 100 clandestine graves. And odor mortis, the smell of death, is now being incorporated into the mortis triad, making it a tetrad. And it's also the ch change in the way law enforcement uh, views crime scenes, because now it can use odor recognition um, incorporated into the evaluation of their, of their crime scenes. In conclusion, I would like to present to you an audio file. This audio file was created by the Labrador, and the sounds you hear are the audio output of the sensors in the, in, in the head of this particular instrument, the Labrador. The sound file is broken down to two different sound bites. The first is human decomposition. The second is animal. I chose pig as that particular animal because most people study pigs because they say they're most similar to human remains. And hopefully you'll see it's not. But um, as you listen to the sound file, pay attention that in human decomposition, which is the first segment, you can pick out the four stages of human decomposition, the fresh bloat, decay, and dry, and see if you can do the same with the animal remains. The point of this is that not only can you differentiate animal from human, but you can also tell what stage of decomposition the human is in. So without further ado, I give you the sound of death in the key of C. And now the pig. How cool is that, see? <laughs> the, death, the death can talk to you, and they can be heard. Thank you.